Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. We are going to finish this section before we uh, jump right into the last section of Colossians. It says, and you masters, actually, it says, masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, I would love for you guys to be able to cross-reference not only this verse, Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, and, and by the way, if we could put our phones on silent, it would be wonderful. And, uh, but if you cross-reference it with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, uh, Paul says to the Ephesians, and you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master in heaven and that, there's, that you have your own master in heaven and that there's no partiality with him. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for uh, your word. We're so grateful for the great work that you have done in our lives and we want to grow, Lord. We don't just want to um, live vertically but we want this vertical relationship with you to affect our horizontal relationships, Lord. We desire, Lord, to be people that, um, that know you, that have experienced a transformation from you, and that in turn we are able to walk in love towards you and towards those around us, from the most intimate to the, those that we have that we don't know at all. I just pray, Father, that we would be examples of your kingdom, examples of um, this new nation, this new humanity that you have created. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, we've been going through Colossians, and, and we saw in chapters 1, we saw the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. Paul prays, Paul prays that the, the Colossians would know what God is doing, what, what he appreciates, what he loves. And, and, and he prays that the, the Ephesians would know that. Sorry, the Colossians. To the Ephesians, he prayed that they would know him and the hope of his calling. But, but just a realization in these two epistles that, that the identity of man, the, the greatest thing going on in the universe is Jesus supreme. Jesus magnificent, Jesus sufficient. In chapter 3, we saw that uh, we have been made alive. The believer is not just a person that just changes his mind, but God changes his heart. There's a transformation, there's a resurrection, there's a, there was a deadness, and now there is a life. And Paul, in, 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 in talking about all these things going on in our hearts <clears throat> through the Spirit of God, begins to, in verse 18, say, Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not embitter your children. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. And now today, masters, treat your workers right. And you see, it's amazing to me because oftentimes in our society, we, we kind of have to, te we tend to have biases. You know, if you have one pol political party, kind of tends to go with the employee. If you have another one, it kind of goes with the, with the company, the privileges of the company and, and to build the company. And, 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 and here you see that God is, shows no partiality. He's complete fairness in the family. It's not fathers rule over your children. As children, obey your fathers, but father, don't, don't embitter your children. And companies, it's not just for the employee. Hey, employee, work hard, but hey, master, you have a master in heaven. Be fair. Do what's right. And it's just wonderful how it just works itself so fairly, so practically into daily life. When a person becomes a Christian, he becomes affected in every area of life. He begins to know and love the Lord, to experience a new life within. 
and a gratefulness that Jesus is sufficient and supreme. And this in turn creates a grateful heart that is not only concerned with self, but rather with how to please him from whom everything we enjoy comes from. And I want to look at something that, is, that, is, that stands out, although it's in all the verses, it stands out in this one when it talks about masters. It says, uh, it's about the motivation. Motivations are great drivers in our life. What drives you? What motivates you in life? What do you live for? What do you sit up? What do you go to the beach and dream about? What do you sit in bed and dream of? What makes you get up in the morning? What makes you do good? Motivations are powerful, powerful um, drivers in our life. And here, we have two motivations in these verses. Number one, we have the moti um, our motivation as Christians, as believers, whether it's the wife, whether it's the husband, whether it's the children, whether it's the parents, whether it's the employee or the employer, the motivation is to be the same, the Lord. Notice, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your, your uh, parents because this is pleasing to the Lord. Servants, obey your masters from the heart as unto the Lord. And masters, knowing that your own master is also in heaven. Do you see the incredible motivation here? He... Like the servant, the master, is the slave of Jesus Christ, and he is to be living for his glory, for the glory of Jesus. Not living for self, but when a person becomes a believer, Jesus said this, let a man first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. He begins to live to please someone else out of gratitude, out of a tremendous experience of, 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 of salvation, of transformation. And this gratitude in turn says, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for you. Not to earn, but because it's been freely given to us, this beautiful, dynamic relationship with the Lord. And we see it with Peter. To me, you know, I, I can identify with Peter more than anybody else in the Bible. But, you know, I mean, Peter spoke when he didn't know what to say. That's exactly what I do. Peter told Jesus what he should do. That's exactly what I do. Jesus, uh, Peter was boastful, said, I will never deny you. And then he has a big crisis. That's exactly what I do. I think I know it. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't know like I should know. But you know what, what? What we can see in the life of Jesus is that when he had failed greatly, when he told, you know, at one point he said to Jesus, Jesus, get away from me. I'm a sinful man with the fish. But when he had denied the Lord and the Lord had manifested himself, resurrected, he had risen from the grave and he's about to depart and go to heaven, Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I do love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And he says, do you love me? And he says, yes, I do love you, Lord. And he says, tend my lambs. Do you love me, said Jesus, and he says, oh yes, I do. You know all things. You know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Isn't that amazing? The motivation is, if you love me, love others. The motivation in Peter's life became, I love you, Lord. And, 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 and Jesus, in turn, what he says, because you love me, love other people. Not because they love you, but in spite of however they treat you. 
Paul and Peter remembering this in 1 Peter 5, 2, remembering and speaking to pastors later on, he says, serve not because you have to, but willingly. Just a great, just out of love for the Lord is what, is, is why we do the things that we do. There's one verse in, in Philemon, which actually has to do with slavery. It, it was Philemon was uh, the, the, the owner, and then Onesimus was the, the, the slave. And what happened is both of them had become Christians. Now what happens here? Now how is the whole thing going to pan out? And Paul writes Philemon, in Philemon verses 8 and 9, it only has one chapter, it says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal. And without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. I want to keep him with me because he's really, he's really helping me out, but I want to do nothing without your permission that your good deed might not be because you have to, but because you are willing to, for love's sake. There's no greater motivation in all of our relationships that we do things out of love for Jesus and out of love for people. It's a great driver. Love is the most powerful driver in the world. There's stories of, of, um, of, of a child, say a three-year-old, has been caught underneath a car. And there is, there's, this, there's, there's stories about women, uh, the mom going up to the car and out of love for that child, just pick up the car and move it. Love. Powerful motivator. And the masters and the employers are to be driven by love in their hearts and not just financial gain. Not just driving people. Not just milking people. Not just how can I get more out of people. You know what's, you know what's crazy? Even companies in the world today Google, Apple, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're developing uh, schemes in, 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 their, in their work environments where they're actually caring for the people because they know that they will get, receive more from the people if they love them and cherish them than if they just drive them. But one motivator for the Christian is to be loved. But another motivation here, and this is a this is, um, very powerful one as well. Another motive uh, sh that should govern the whole of our Christian life is living with the reality that our lives are accountable to the Lord Jesus. Realizing that one day, you and I will have to give an account for our life. Now, as believers, we believe that our sin has been dealt with. So we, we do not peer, appear before him to give account for our, our sins because Jesus paid it all as we sang today. But there is a motivation of rewards, realizing that we will have to give account to him for our lives and some of the stuff that we did will be worthless because it was just pure selfishness, and yet there will be certain rewards. And it's amazing how rewards are such powerful drivers in our life. I mean, we saw the people that, uh, the, the, the group from Norway, that they said, you know, that we had candy, we had this, and it's amazing how sometimes, you know, it's like, hey, you're not gonna get your candy at the end of the day unless you behave, it works with the kids. Rewards are powerful motivators. 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Everyone's work will become clear. Each one's work will be tested. 2 Corinthians 5.9-10, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I'm going to show off here a little bit today. I have three weeks I've been running every day. 
I haven't run since I was in the military 30 years ago. You know, I had to get a, uh, we, the military, you had a test uh, once a year that you had to get between 270 and 300. The max was 300. And if you got between 270 and 300, you didn't have to do any more exercise with the whole group. Man, I worked hard until I got 270. And then I was done with it. And then I got out of the military, never worked out again. I just did the stuff that hiking, whatever. I was quite active, so it was okay. But I'm at an age now where my core was becoming weaker. It was painful to turn in my bed. I mean, just no muscle, you know? So I decided, okay, I'm going to run. I'm going to get my core strong, and I've been working out. And then, and, and right before that, uh, you know, I have a, this Apple Watch. And right before I started working out, uh, you have these rings you can close. And, and my watch began to say, come on, at 11 p.m., come on, you can do it. You can close the rings. I said, I would say, no, I can't. But then I began to run. And next thing you know, it gave me a, 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 an award. You ran, you've run five days in a row. Good for you. And I got a badge. And now there's one where it's like, if you run seven days in a row, you get another badge. And it's got the ones that you can win. If you, I don't know if it was like, if you can run 1,500 kilometers in one year, you know, I was just like, no, I don't want that badge. You know, I don't want it that bad. But it's amazing how rewards are tremendous motivators. At one point this week, I was so sore. And then I thought, but I got my five-day thing. I could get it. And then Loretta goes, come on, get out there. And not to mention the reward of maybe losing some weight and, and, and getting a bit stronger, you know. But rewards are great motivators as well. Notice Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus sustained, Jesus was sustained through the cross by this powerful motivator who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So not only was love his motivator, but Jesus actually, he came to earth, and he went straight into the worst death that we could ever imagine, that he actually did not want to go through. He said, Lord, if there, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the thing, the reward, therefore the joy set before him, the reward was that he could buy you and me to have a meaningful relationship with him. Reward. Strengthen them. This helped him. That sustained him. What does that mean? It means that the hope of being with him changing us, sustains us, and helps us. And he's saying to the boss, he's saying, you know what? You have a master in heaven who loves you, whom you love, and who is fair with you and rewards you, so therefore be fair with those that are working for you. It's crazy, huh? All of our lives going around the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My goodness, if we all surrender to the kingdom of God, we live in a heaven. And this teaching should always be in our hearts, in all our thinking and in all our living. It greatly encourages you, encourages us. And notice in Ephesians, I don't know if you want to turn to Ephesians 6, 8, it says knowing. Twice it says knowing. One in verse 8 for the servants and one in verse 9 for the masters. It says knowing. They both know something. It is not a strange doctrine. And, and they know that they should be governed what, by this. And my question is, what is it that they know? What is it that in Ephesians 6 that they both know the master? And in verse 5 of Ephesians 6, it says, Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. And in verse 9, it says, it says, 
uh, beware because you have your own master in heaven. And the question is, what is it that they know? What is it that they need to be aware of? And the answer is that all that happens to us in this world belongs to the temporary. That this is a passing transient life, whether you are a boss, whether you are a billionaire, or whether you are struggling with not enough, no matter where you are in life, no matter what trial it is that you're going through in life, it is passing. Whatever position it is in life, this world is only a temporary arrangement. It is not eternal. In Corinthians it says, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And nothing is more important than to realize that it is temporary. Can I have two volunteers? Um, Bart, can you be one? And Steffi, can you be the other one? Grab this. Grab that. And pull. Until you can't pull anymore. Yeah, but not hard. You don't have to pull. You're not play, playing uh, war, tug, war, tug of war here. I mean, this is a pretty short line. But look. Can you see that dot? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's your life. Actually, your life is probably much less than that on the earth. You know, you think of the history of life. You think of eternity. That's your life. Just a small... You, you ever feel bad for a fly that comes over for a week and then just passes away? In the light of eternity, that's our life. It's just passing. It's okay. And you might be struggling with some terrible problem. Maybe it's almost crushing you at the moment. Maybe some situation that is almost impossible for anyone to endure. Or your difficulty may be concerning your health. It doesn't matter what situation we are in life. Whether we are abounding, whether we are abased, whether we are just cruising, it is temporary. It is an absolutely temporary life. Remember that whatever it is, is passing. Whether it's illness, whether it's mental illness. And this is the secret of Christians throughout history and throughout the geography that we live in and throughout the world that we live in. The secret of the Christian in enduring difficulties or in, bear, or in being fair or in accountability in life or love has been that powerful motivator of eternity of how quickly our lives are going to pass away. In India, you know that some of the pastors, some of the evangelists, they go to teach to different towns. They actually dig their grave before they go in, knowing that because they're preaching the gospel, they might be put to death. In Iran, it is illegal to be baptized. If you're caught, it is death penalty. And Jesus said this, be not afraid of them that killed the body, and after that there's no more than they can do. Fear him, which after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, fear him. So whatever our position is on earth, the thing that the master and the servant know is knowing that it is something in the flesh, knowing that we're destined for heaven, knowing that it is temporary. And you see, the Christ, you see the believers, the Old Testament believers, that they were people who had this eye on eternity. They had this eye on in heaven. And let me tell you this, guys. Listen, you guys are longing for heaven. You guys are longing for eternity. 
Those of us that are just looking for something, our souls are yearning. And you look for it. You look for it on some beach. You look at it in some adventure. You look at it in some person. You look at it in some island. You look at it in some um, whatever it is. There, there's something in you that is longing for something bigger. You're longing for heaven. The thing is that it's not on earth. It's not on earth. And the Christian man who lives with his eye on these things, you know, like Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven. So both slaves and masters, they need to live in the realm of heaven. So in, 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 in Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 10 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I mean, he looked beyond earth. He looked for a city. And what does this produce in us? You know, when we have this motivation of love, when we have this motivation of rewards, when we have this view that it is temporal, that our lives are temporal, it's just, I mean, we could get a diagnosis today that we have a week. We could get hit by a car. Anything could happen. I mean, our lives are temporal. What does that produce in us when we realize these things? Well, rather than living under the laws of the Torah, here the Christians in Colossians had received a new power through the resurrection of Jesus. Following Jesus meant joining the new community of lives connected to Jesus. And the temptation is to just live on earth, just looking to heaven. I just can't wait till heaven comes. I can't wait. And, 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 and you've heard this expression. Some people are so heavenly minded that there are no earthly good. But we are not to be constantly thinking about leaving earth as an escapist. But Paul challenges them to live in the present as the new humans that they are becoming. to leave away their old humanity, the distorted sexuality, the destructive speech, and to live with the replacement that Jesus puts there, with his, with it, which is his own humanity, filled with mercy, filled with generosity, filled with forgiveness, filled with righteousness, filled with justice, filled with kindness, filled with love. I mean, it's, he says it in verse 12 of chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. And this creates in us, when we walk in this way, and when, we, and when this becomes infectious, it creates an, an environment of love, an environment of joy, an environment uh, of peace in the Holy Spirit. It, it, it creates a stability, an identity, a direction, a stamina, a hope that no trial on earth will be able to quench. Now, yesterday I had an interesting in, in situation. Uh, Helly's not here; she's downstairs. But we yesterday, uh, so so Helly parked her van for the youth event. She parked it in um, in the Santa Ponsa where they do the market. So when she went to pick up the car, the car wasn't there. And so, first thing she did, she called Loretta. Oh my goodness, the car's been—I I don't know where it is. 
So I, I called a friend and they told me where the tow place was, where they, where they stash uh, stored cars, towed cars. And, and we went over there. And when I got there, the lady, uh, I, I said, hey, could, could we get the car? She goes, is the car yours? And I said, no, it's not ours. It's been lent to us. She's like, oh, you can't get the car. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness, there's the youth. They can't go to this camp. The last day of camp, it's just ruined because of this situation. And I said, oh, could you, could you help us? He's like, no, sorry. I mean, I'm legally bound to do this. And, and she was, you could see she was just, you know, when people get, when they get kind of like, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness. And I said, I understand. I understand the legal implications that you could be responsible if we just, but I mean, we do have the key, but it's okay. I understand. What can I do to fix it? And she says, I need a written statement from Werner and Lizzie, that the owners of the, the van, that uh, they allow you to pick it up. So I immediately wrote uh, Werner and Lizzie. And, um, and, and, and within five minutes, boom, I had the authorization with their ID and everything. And, and, and it was just perfect. And so she's like, OK, I, I can do it. So she starts typing away, and, and she starts just arranging everything. And I said, so how are you? And she looks at me and she says, you don't want to know. When I heard that, I was like, no, I don't want to know. <laughs> you know, no. you know so, sometimes we have that battle. No, we, we kind of want to, but we, we have a battle. We, the spirit is there and the flesh is there. And these are two are at war with one another. And in that moment, what do you do in that situation? And I said, no, really, let me know what's going on. And then she says, you see this little gadget here? That is a gadget to warn me because my ex-husband husband from 12 years ago carries a bracelet because of abuse. And if he gets near me, this box begins to make noise and calls the police for me. Now, I just found out that he's abused, he's beaten and threatened two women that he was with after me. And that he's loose and that he's on a rage. And I called my daughter and I said, please. Do not dare to talk to your dad. He's on a rampage. And, you know, here in the news, it wouldn't be strange that you would see her on the news in a couple of days. It's just, you know, and, and I just kind of thought, oh, my goodness, you just don't know what people are going through. And here we have the great motivator of love, the great motivator of reward, and the great a motivator of eternity. And so when it was all said and done, we were finished, I was saying goodbye. I said, can I give you a hug? And she's like, sure. So I said, here. And I gave her a hug, and I was like, yeah, but that's not enough. I wanted to leave it there, and the Lord was just kind of challenging me. He was like, just pray with her. I said, can I pray with you? And you would have thought I started speaking Chinese. She's like, huh? And I said, yeah, can I pray with you? And I just prayed with her. And I was like, Lord, I just pray uh, for, I'm not going to say the name. And, uh, just, and, and I just pray that you will protect her, that you will be with the child, that you will help this man come to his senses. And, and, and Lord, that they will come to know you and, and your great love for them in Jesus' name. And she just was, by the end of it, she was bawling. And then she hugged, and immediately she went next door to tell the other guy what had just happened to her. You know, these guys, they came to, I, didn't, I mean, probably never happened before. The, the car got towed, we pay the fines, we get the evidence, and then they prayed for me. But I was just kind of struck as I was preparing for this. Isn't that what God is doing? Isn't God creating a new humanity that is able to look at people and say, because of love to God, I'm going to treat you right. Because of rewards, because of what might happen in your life. And not only that, because of eternity, because we can influence people for eternity. These three motivators in our life. And Paul is using this with husbands, wives, children, Parents, workers, employers, keep Jesus at the center. And it will go well. It will go well. 
I almost want to say, any questions? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, Loretta and I, uh, we got in an argument uh, last week, two days in a row. I, it, pretty strong arguments, actually. And we hadn't argued in quite a while, uh, at least not like that, and two days in a row. But a few years ago, um, so just not to tell you a story from a long time ago, it happened recently, but I'm going to tell you one that happened a long time ago, that we, were argue, we had a really big argument, and I got a phone call from a dear friend, and he said, how are you, Raf? And I said, I don't, I don't really feel like talking. I just had an argument with Loretta, and I'm not doing well, and I don't feel like talking. And I hung up. So he wrote me an email. And he said, Raph, I was really concerned about our conversation. Please take care of my sister. Now, it wasn't his sister biologically. It was Christian sister. And all of a sudden, I realized, my goodness, when Loretta and I converse, when we deal with each other, we're not just dealing. I'm not just dealing with my wife. I'm dealing with God's daughter. When I'm talking to my kids and I lose it because I lose it sometimes, I'm not talking to my kids. I'm talking to God's cherished children. And I need to grow in my relationship with the Lord to see everything in the light of Christ. Out of love for Him, out of reward, because we will benefit if we sow righteously, we will reap righteously. And out of the fact that we are eternal. And you know, in these workouts that I've been doing, it's always the same thing. Come on, you can give it a little bit more. You can give it a little bit more. Why? Because of the reward. And you don't feel like it. Sometimes you're just like, no, I can't hit my butt one more time with my heels. No, no, no. And then you do it because you just have five seconds left. And you endure it. So may we keep Jesus at the center of every single one of our relationships because we will have great reward and we will benefit, we will benefit joy, love, and hope from walking that way. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, to have your word. <laughs> I mean, written 2,000 years ago, it could have been so biased and yet it isn't. It is so fair, it is crazy. And it speaks to our world today so beautifully, so dynamically, so piercingly. And I just pray that here, all of us today would just hear the words, do you love me? And that our response would be, yes, we love you. And that you will help us to see what relationships we need to cherish, what relationships we need to tend what people we need to bless and that our lives will be filled not with anger, bitterness, frustration, but that our lives will become, will be the outflow of peace with you, of love to you, of kindness to others, of mercy, of forgiving people because we ourselves have been forgiven so much. Have your way with us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us not to live this life on our own. Help us to realize that there's no such thing as a lone Christian. We are in the intensive care unit of your kingdom, Lord. And you're breathing life into us. You're raising us. You're transforming us in time right through to eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.